Hello, this is Harvey Ambrose. I am preaching this message uh, on behalf of the Missionary Baptist Voice of Africa radio station located in Monrovia, Liberia. Um, it is for the 8 p.m. Uh, broadcast on Sunday nights. And uh, for the benefit of the listeners there, and uh, those of you who do listen, uh, I want to thank you for listening and uh, for sending letters and and text, much appreciated. And when you can, I ask you to remember me, prayers. Today we will read from Genesis chapter 16 in our ongoing study of the book of Genesis, and particularly at this point, the life of Abraham, whom, as I read before in Isaiah, we are told to look to him. Those of us who follow after righteousness, those of us who seek the Lord, both for salvation and for living as a child of God in this world of which we are no longer truly residents. So uh, we are to take his example, uh, warts and all, as Cromwell said, uh, the Bible shows him just as he was, good points, bad points. And such is the life, even of the saved of this earth. It's not like when he saves us. He saves us and, and we are perfect from then on. We are still in the flesh. It's just our spirits have been changed. The desires of our hearts have been changed. But, but within us still dwells uh, a sinful nature, meaning in the flesh. Paul says that in his body, that is in his flesh, Dwelleth no good thing. That is true for all of us. The only good thing that's in us is that which God has created new within our hearts. That's good. It's a work of God. It's not of our own doing, but it's by his mercy and his grace. That which he creates will stand the test of time and will see God face to face in the end and not be destroyed. Genesis chapter 16 our reading lesson, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah, he said unto Abraham, or to Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid, it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian. <clears throat> After Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Sarah E said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid unto thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarah E, Behold, thy maid is in thine hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. 
and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Birla Hyroi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Berith. And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. And with mistakes that I made in the reading, that's Genesis chapter 16 is our lesson and is our text. You know, I mentioned in the preamble to this sermon, if you want to call it that, that uh, that when the Lord portrays Abraham, whom he calls the father of the faithful, not that he's our physical father, not that he's truly our spiritual father, but that we are his seed in the same sense that through the promises made to Abraham, that, that someone from him, born of his lineage, would one day uh, bless all the nations of the earth. Well, the particular blessing being talked about, even though our Lord Jesus Christ is that seed that was promised, and even though the Lord Jesus Christ uh, upholds all things by, the, by the, the, the might of his power, by the word of his power, uh, he gives us our air and our food and our shelter and our and our relations and, and everything that we have that's good comes down from him to us and blesses us. Though we be not aware of it, though we are not thankful for it, he, he has his son to rise and set upon us every day. He sends the, the rain that comes. He, he causes the fructification of the, of, of the crops that are planted in the field. All these things come from Jesus, but that is not, uh, that is not the predominant means whereby he blesses us. Those are only physical blessings, and they, they endure for a short time, just like us, and then they no longer bless us. We'll be dead. Our bodies will be dead lying in a grave, and the rain, and the sun, and the food, and the shelter, and the family, and the friends will be of no benefit to us nor we to them. That will be done. But the blessing that he is particularly talking about when he blessed Abraham and that that blessing, that blessed seed which would come from, and I say seed singular, not all of his offspring, but one, only one, Jesus would come from him and bless all the nations of the earth that blessing is not a carnal blessing. It is a blessing given to the spirits of people who have sought with all their heart the living God. And by his grace and mercy, he hath enabled them to find him. That blessing, it endures unto eternal life. It, it is obedient to the commandment of the Father, which is life everlasting, according to Jesus. It is something that is here today and forever and ever and ever. World without end. We shall, we shall benefit in, in glory and in joy unspeakable in the blessing that Jesus Christ, uh, the famous seed of Abraham, brings to us when he creates in us a new heart, when he takes away the old stony heart that by nature we have. And he gives us a tender heart of flesh, tender towards God in the first place and towards our fellow man in the second. When he totally changes us from within so that even the outward man, sinful though it may be, is also changed. And, and, and more than changed, predestined by God uh, to be conformed to the very image of that famous seed of Abraham's 
Jesus Christ. So Abraham being the, the father or great, 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 whoever knows how many times great grandfather of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the father of those who are the faithful, meaning those who have been given faith so that they are able to trust with all their heart that the Lord Jesus Christ will take care of them. Who, who forsake the world and all that it's got. We may not do it all the time, but at least once in our lives, the Lord so humbled us and so gifted us with, 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 with a confidence in Christ that he would take care of us ultimately and forever and, and, and not even knowing that yet in our need, in our poverty of spirit. He enables us to call upon Jesus. And we get him. He reveals his son. Truly God's son. But Abraham's seed. He reveals him. Not to these eyes or these ears. But to our heart. Now I know I'm getting off this deck. But we need to understand why God turns us to Abraham and says he's the father of the faithful because Abraham was a man like us and, and he was a sinner like us. He was a idol worshiper like we are. Whether uh, his be a different idol, false god than ours, we all worship something. Most of us in America worship money and the ones that are worse off than that worship ourselves. Because of the, the great pride that is falsely instilled in us. As though we're something special, I think is what our country would have us to believe. The only special thing about this country is that God has blessed it in the past. Those days seem to be coming to an end because we have turned our back on him. We will likely, if the Lord does not come back and prevent it sooner, we will, go the all, we will go the way of all former nations whom God has judged. But getting off topic, I need to get back on. So here's another story. We learn how some good things have happened to Abraham, and those have all been by God. Some bad things have happened to Abraham, and those have all been because of weakness of his flesh. They weren't things that, that Abraham sought out. He was not a... And I'm, I'm using Abraham and Abram as though they're the same. His name is changed at one point, and that's coming up, and we'll get past that. I won't have to say over and over again how I keep messing up his name. Same with Sarai, which, you know, I don't know how to pronounce it. I've looked it up in Strong's, and that's the closest I can get. Her name gets changed. So it goes Abraham and Sarah at one point, and we're all familiar with that, but I apologize for not being able to pronounce these words properly. But every problem that he's had, he has had not through a, from what I can tell, an intentional, uh, a deliberate offense to God, but because he got caught up in, in the affairs of day-to-day -day life and suddenly was presented with an issue, uh, a concern, a fear, and he dealt with it without without adequate uh, searching out for the leadership of God. He lied in Egypt about his wife, said, he was his, said that she was his sister. He, he delayed his departure to the, to the land that God would show him. He just hung around in Haran until his father died. We don't know how long that was. But we know however long it was, it was too long. He finally gets back on track. He has his faults, just like all of us does. But it did not prevent Abraham. It did not stop him being saved. It did not cause him to lose salvation. An impossible thing anyway, but it doesn't happen. It didn't happen with him. But God is gracious here to show us that we don't have to live perfect lives. A good thing, because we cannot do so. There's only one that did so. And, and, and he is our Lord. And I won't go on about that right now. So here we have a situation where God has promised Abraham, Abram 
more than once that he would make of him a great nation, that he would have multiple offsprings, as, as, the, as the dust of the earth, as, as the stars are in heaven, uh, innumerable, he said, so shall thy seed be. Without re-preaching those things, understand that these were promises that God gave to Abram. Abram believed them. His wife believed them. They were both faithful to God and, and they, they dwelt as, sang, uh, as strangers and pilgrims in a land that God had taken them to and where they didn't own a thing except their, their possessions that they could fit in their tents and the, and the people that God had put in his way and had become their servants. In many cases, this means slaves. And in this case, it certainly means a slave. Hagar was the female slave belonging to Sarah. Uh, in fact, the chances are, since she was an Egyptian, that she was one of the men servant and maid servants that, that uh, Genesis earlier told us that, that Pharaoh gave to Abraham and apparently to Sarah, uh, to be Sarah, uh, when he was uh, being uh, generous towards Abram because he was planning to take Sarai to, to his bed, to be his wife. And he was treating uh, Abram as though he were a brother-in-law, and he was gifting him with the riches that Egypt had. Of course, that fell apart, but Moses still came out with all those possessions, including all those slaves. So now we have uh, one problem compounding another. Because he received Egyptian slaves as gifts from Pharaoh and kept them, and I'm not saying that it's that it's because slavery was condemned. It was not. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think the Lord is in favor of it. The Lord has always given men and women of this world freedom. He uh, he gives them the freedom uh, of agency whereby they can. Do as they choose. He does not constrain people. He does not force them, despite what others believe. I am completely confident on it. He does not force salvation on anybody. Now, he draws people, and many are called, few are chosen, but that's another sermon too. Uh, but And this one isn't going too good, but I'm wanting us to understand, though, that the, the, the things that we do in our life, whenever that happens to us, maybe seemingly a small thing at the time, it eventually it follows us and eventually brings trouble. You know, we read in the Bible where it says, be sure your sins will find you out. And it's illustrated in the story of uh, Ahab and Jezebel, and we won't go there. But again, your sins find you out. Abram should never have been given Hagar as a slave because he never should have lied to the Egyptians about Sarai being his wife. But he did. And those lies are starting to, to come back to haunt him, if you will. Now, Abram is, is happy. We don't read that there's a problem. You know, Lot has been rescued. Uh, the separation is made. The Lord has blessed him. He has, he has told him about his physical progeny of being like the dust of the earth, just extremely fruitful and, and multiplied. I think he's talked about his spiritual seed being as the stars of heaven innumerable and made thus stars, if you will, by his famous offspring, which Abram knows will be the savior of the world. Things are great for him. He's rich. He's increased in goods. He's where God wants him. But he has some slaves and he has a wife. And the wife is believed, just like he has, that the Lord was going to give them children. But now Abram, at 85 years old, and Sarah, at 75 years old, neither one of them has a child. Uh, he'd been told when he 
brought it up last chapter about, he says, I have no offspring, but, but a servant born in my house is, is going to be my heir. And God says, no, that's not going to be your heir. Someone that comes from your own bowels, meaning from, from his DNA, uh, one of your physical descendants will be your heir. But he didn't say, and it'll be Sarah's descendant too. They had probably taken that for granted. But now that's called into doubt. I think it's called into doubt because the promise is there. They believe it's going to happen. But it wasn't specifically said that Sarah would be the mother of this line of people leading to Christ. And now it's 75 years old and she's never had children before. It appears that she never will. I mean, she's 75. Her husband's 85. That's getting on up there, folks. Even for those days, that's old. Well, she's got a she's got a handmaid. Now I don't, you know, I've tried to look this up. It's not necessarily that this woman was was a young maiden, you know, as we would say. It, that word handmaid just means female slave. She has a uh, she has a female slave, but she had to be of at least childbearing years. She was much younger than Sarah, or Sarah would not have said. This will do. But she approaches Abraham. Abra or Abram is like, he's happy. But Sarah is, is not because she has no offspring. And she's waited and she's waited and she's waited. And it's not happened yet. So she takes it into her mind. Well, maybe I have a slave and all that my slave has is mine. So if she has a child, on my behalf, that child is my child. And we know that that is the case that happened with uh, Jacob's wives, who had children after children with, with their slaves, you know, between their, their handmaidens and their husband, Jacob. That's apparently was a custom. Your slave's child is yours if you want him. So she says, she approaches Abram. And she makes that proposal. And Abram should have said, no, no, it's not right. From the beginning, it was not so. We know that that's true. That's in the Bible now. I think he knew it in his heart because the Lord taught them directly many times back then. And, and he knew it wasn't right to have more than one wife. He, he knew that monogamy is how it was in the beginning with with our first parents, Adam and Eve. They didn't multiply wives to themselves. And to the extent that God's people did do that, it would appear that it was at least God used it towards the, the multiplication of, of people to populate the earth. Still not making it right. I think Abram knew it, but he also was very anxious to have a child. And he says that he, uh, he hearkened to the voice of, Sarah, e, his wife, and he went in unto this slave. Now notice, we don't read that the slave was consulted. We don't read that, that Sarah e spoke to Hagar and said, oh, by the way, this is, this is what I'm planning. I think it'd be great for you to go into my, uh, my 85-year-old husband and be his wife and, and lie with him and, and, and bring up children that will belong to me. We don't read any of that. I suspect it didn't happen. She was a slave. Slaves do as they're told. And those who own slaves, and if there's any of you out there that own slaves now, you better be good to them because God takes note. He notices. It, it's okay to be a servant. It's not okay to be a, an evil master. It's not okay to treat your servants or your employees or the people in your household as though they were dirt. God sees that. He hears the prayers and sees the thoughts. It feels the feelings of people that are mistreated. I can't hardly imagine that a young woman would want to lie with an 85-year-old man. You know, when you hear this preach, and when I've heard it preached, it's all like, well, you know, she had a, she realized she was uh, with child by Abraham, uh, by Abram, Hagar did. And it's like, uh, well, now she despised Sarah because, you know, 
Uh, well, I had a child by him and you weren't able to because you're barren. And maybe that was the case, I don't know. But she had a lot more reason to despise her mistress than just that. She had been, as a slave, directed to go have a carnal relationship. Even though she became his wife, she was a second wife, which is not appropriate. Not certainly not for the people of God. Well, not for anyone. It's a, it's a, it should be a relationship between one man and one woman for life till death do they part. That is the biblical example. That's what God wants us to do. She, in some state of youth, whether it be thirties or twenties or teens, I don't know, but it wasn't old. It wasn't. Surely it wasn't going to be past, you know, mid thirties. Going to, to lie with an old man. And now she finds herself pregnant by him. That's a pretty good reason to despise her mistress. Her mistress gave her reason to despise her. Sarai should have treated her so much better than that. Abram should never have consented to it. But they both did what they did. And as soon as Sarah E. recognizes that, that Hagar has some contempt for her. I don't know that she asked her the, the nature of the contempt. I don't know if she even cared. It would appear that, that Sarah E., the, the master of the slave, the mistress of the slave, was jealous. Maybe jealous because she had an offspring. Or maybe she's just upset because she felt guilty over what she did. And, and whatever look it was that Hagar had, it made it clear to Sarah E why she was despised by her slave. We, don't, we didn't see the look, and it's not written. But it's probably one of those two or both. I'm able to have children, you're not. Maybe that was the look. Or maybe it was hatred because she was been placed in a in a sinful relationship that never should have occurred. She didn't ask to be made a slave. Pharaoh did that. He gave it to her. She did. Abram could have set them all free. He didn't. Sarah could have done it. She didn't. At the very least, they should have treated her like another human being. Uh, you know, we are taught by Jesus what we ought to do. He shall do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He says, uh, well, we know what he says. I'm, I'm losing the thought right now. But he says, yeah, here's the two great commandments. The greatest is this, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy might and all thy strength and love thy neighbor as yourself. And he makes it clear who our neighbor is. It's every other living person on this world. That's who it is. We like to talk from quibble and, and say, well, who's my neighbor like the, like the Pharisees did? The brother? If it's a human being, God requires you by his law to love them and to treat them as you would treat yourself. Well, we all fail in that one, don't we? I know I do. God forgive me. God forgive me. But we're like Abraham here. I don't own any slave, don't want to. But I also don't treat my neighbors like I ought to. I, I usually treat them by ignoring them. I don't see myself actively going out and hurting anybody. But that's different from love, ain't it? It's not the same thing. To, to just ignore them is not the same thing as to love them. By the grace of God, I've been made to love people when he's helping me. I love you guys because he has given me a heart for you. I don't expect to see any of you in this world, but I hope to see many of you in a world to come. And we will make acquaintance. We'll know each other on sight because in the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses, 
and Elijah were known to the three apostles that accompanied Jesus up. They one look. It's not like they'd seen uh, Moses and Elijah on TV. They knew him by sight because that's that's the nature of things in the world. We'll all know each other. We'll all know the Lord. And hopefully some of us will have some uh, very well met uh, greetings with each other. Well, anyway. So here is a wart that the Lord shows us of Abram that make him worse than us, makes him like us, makes us like him. It is forgivable. It's bad. It has consequences. There are yet consequences to come. If I can get this preached out, it is terrible. But here, we'll, we'll go on. So she flees. Hagar leaves her, her master. That's a crime. Under the laws of that land back then, that's a crime. She was not her own. Just like if we are the Lord Jesus Christ through second birth, through being born again, it says we are not our own. We are bought with a price. The price was the, the Lord's life itself, poured out, emptied out for sinners like me and you. We are bought. If we are born through him, we are bought by him. We are his particular possession. And we are to do what our master bids us. And that is how slavery is treated in the Bible as an example of how people should be to the Lord their God. We are his creatures. Created for his pleasure. Created in his very image so as to please him greatly. And we so much fail. And we, and we run from our master. And you know, we don't read that Sarai ran after her. All we read was she treated her harshly. As though Hagar had done something wrong. And she fled from her presence. But I tell you, somebody was watching. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we, this is before he was incarnate, before he was made flesh and dwelt among us and, and revealed to us in, in the flesh the glory of the Godhead. This is what we call a Christophany. Sometimes we call it a theophany because see, people say, well, maybe it wasn't Jesus, maybe it was the Father, maybe it was the Spirit. A theophany would just be God appearing as a man or an angel. A Christophany meaning Christ, who is also God, doesn't really matter. But I think the term, the angel of the Lord, this is the first time the word angel has shown up in the Bible. And in this case, the angel of the Lord is almost always in Scripture a reference to Christ. When the angel of the Lord appeared to people, it was Christ it, causing his divine self to be visible to a person. That's what happened. And it says, uh, the angel of the Lord found her. So Hagar was fleeing from her master. She was, a, she was a runaway fugitive slave with no one seeking her. I mean, that would sound kind of good. She was, she was in Shur when, he, when she was found. And Shur was on the way to Egypt. Apparently she was going home. She's getting out of this this mixed up situation she had found herself in through no fault of her own. There she is. Yeah, I mean, it's really disgusting, isn't it? But you think about what ill treatment Sarah had towards her to cause her to go into the, the bed of an 85-year-old man. And, and Abram just, just, whatever, sure, I'll do that. And then when Sarah comes and blames it all on him, he says, she's your slave. Do what you want to. Well, she was his wife by that time too. Hagar became a second wife to Abraham. He had a, an obligation and a duty to, to love her and, and cherish her and take care of her and protect her. No, no, she's your slave. I'm washing my hands of that one. There's Abraham. Think about it. A man of God, a friend of God, we read. This is, I don't know if there's anyone else in the Bible that is called a friend of God. Well, mere men are, are men at best. That's all we are. We, we, can't, we can't rise above our, our physical weakness. Though we try, there will be failings. 
And we need to learn that from here. And here, even though they failed, God did not. I believe it was Jesus that is the angel of the Lord here because that is what's standard in the, in the Old Testament when it refers to it. It's, it's talking about the Lord. He finds her. She took off. Now, does that mean that God didn't know where she was? Of course he knew. But when he came to her, she was at that well in Shur. And the point is he came. <laughs> From wherever he was, he caused himself to be manifest to a person, to a woman, to a pregnant woman, to a slave woman. And in mercy, he finds her and he reveals himself in, in some measure because at the end, he says, did I also see him who seest me? She knew someone had seen her, her tragic condition because God came and he said, he said, I've seen you, but we'll read it. He says, uh, he found her and he said, he calls her by name. And Jesus says, you know, in the gospel according to John, that the good shepherd, and he's the good shepherd, he says, he calleth his sheep by name. I think Hagar got saved. <laughs> he calls her by name. And that is that is how it is with the Lord when he saves you. He, he makes it abundantly clear to you in your heart that he has heard your prayer. He has seen your need. He has been responsive to it. And he has cleansed you from the, the sin that you found yourself in and the, and the hopelessness of your ruined and dark and lost condition. And he has hopeled you in a, in a permanent way. And he, he so met with her and, and assured her because there's something in his voice Never man spake like the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ when he speaks to the human heart in whatever form. In whatever form, it's the same. It's the same person. He finds this poor woman and he helps her. He asks her some questions. He, he says, uh, Hagar. And he tells her who, he knows who she is. Sarah E's maid. Reminding her that she's done wrong by fleeing, regardless of how harsh her, her mass mistress was. Agar, Ceres May, which came thou? And where, where, do you, where do you think, why did you leave? And where do you think you're going to? He's, he's trying to straighten her mind up, get her, get her focus back on her responsibilities and, 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 and what her prospects truly ought to be. Going back to Egypt. You know, we read that the people of God have had opportunity to go back, but they didn't. They looked for a better land, not for what they left behind. I tell you, you can't go back. There's been so many places I've over time wished I'd never left, but, but you can't truly ever go back. And if you try to, it doesn't work. When God removes you, you're removed. Well, God didn't remove her. She needed to go back. That's what he says. He says, uh, where are you going? And she said, I flee. She confessed, I, I'm a runaway slave. I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord spoke more. He says, return to your mistress. Servants, obey your masters. And that word in the New Testament, it's the same thing. It means slave, slaves. As wretched as it may be to be a slave for other people, particularly, it's still the lot where the Lord has placed you. Be obedient to your masters. Slaves or servants, obey your masters. Return to your mistress. Submit thyself. However unpleasant it may be, submit thyself to her hands. You know, and what comes to my mind is, regardless of how bad uh, she's treated you, I'll deal with her. She's my slave. I'll deal with Sarah E. She's my slave. And he did. He did. The results of this have, have lasted to this, various, to this very day. And, uh, and, and he tells her, he says, here's what's going to happen to you. I'm, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bring up of this one that you're pregnant with now. I'm going to bring up a, a huge nation. 
You're gonna he, you're gonna call him Ishmael. It means God hears. <laughs> See, God had heard her in her affliction, and He was determined to help her and to bless her, even though she had disobeyed the law of God and fleeing from a master, even though she had despised her mistress, who who very well was deserving of uh, of that contempt. But she was in trouble, and the Lord delights in helping people in trouble. Says, you're with child. You're going to bear a son. He's going to be Ishmael. I've heard your affliction. He's going to be a wild man. And, and it, it, that could mean various things, but it's always like a wild ass or a wild, wild donkey of a man. Donkeys are strong and dangerous and stubborn. And, and that's how Ishmael is going to be in his whole progeny. His hand, meaning, you know, his hand, his works. He's, he's going to be at war against every man. And every man's going to be at war against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. So they're all going to be around him. He's not going to go off by himself. He's not going anywhere. And those descendants to this day, we read them about them in the newspaper. If we read newspapers, we see about them online. We hear about them on TV. Uh, it was the Arab people or the children of Ishmael. And is it not so to this day? Their hand is against everybody, and everybody's against them. And God suffers this to happen. He, you know, there are consequences to things. The man of God, the friend of God, allowed such a thing to happen. And his wife, the blessed Sarah, the, the mother of us all, it says, she allowed it to happen. Well, they're going to allow it to happen. He's going to allow them to be here. And a lot of them can get saved, too, and have been saved. There's nothing preventing the descendants of Ishmael whether it be the physical descendants or, if you will, the, the spiritual seed. The Muslim religion claims by many of them to be descendants of Ishmael, and they certainly are in their behavior towards their fellow man. They're against them. Their fellow man is against them. She called the name of the Lord, so she had a name for God. It says, Thou God seest me you've seen me and then she says because have i also here looked at him who looked at me so it's all about see the lord saw her in her affliction she saw the lord and, and the words used here is just long, almost exactly the same words that were used when moses asked to see his glory up in the mountain and the lord says i'll cause my goodness to pass by. I'm going to put you in a cleft of the rock, and, and I'm going to cause my goodness to pass before you, and you'll see my back parts. And this is the same word. There were, there's some, some, something about this Christophany. It, it's not a full face thing because he's not veiled in flesh like he later was when he was born of a virgin, but he had to be veiled or she would have died at the experience. We can't see God and live. So here he is showing something, but not his full glory. And she would call that the, the back of him. I don't know. Maybe it was a back. I don't know. And it says, and because of this, the well is called Beer Le Haroi. And, it, and I think it just means God seeth, or the God that is seen. And that's the name of the well. And she turned around and went back. It says, Hagar. Bear Abram a son, and Abram called his name Ishmael, just like God had told her, and she must have told him. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. So, so what we're talking about, he was 85, and a year later when the son was born, he's 86. That's how we get the dates for these things and the ages. The Bible tells us. We don't have time for it. I've, I've gone too long. I've got a minute left, and... But for your own study, it is worth reading in the book of Galatians, in chapter 4, Paul relates to us, through the, to the Galatians, uh, to, or to us through the Galatian uh, letter that he wrote, that God uses these two women. They're consequential. It's caused so much issue in the world that he uses them as an example of two types of people. Those who are slaves and he's talking about the sin and those who are free have been set free by the lord jesus the slaves 
or the children of the handmaid because her child was just a natural childbirth, like anybody can have. She went in with Abram, and they had a child. They named him Ishmael, and, and, and those are fleshly children. And we're all fleshly. We're all born of such a coupling into this world. But when Isaac came, that was an impossible thing. She was barren. She was, by the time uh, he's born, Sarah is 90 years old, and Abram 100. You know. Well past childbearing, bearing all her life. This was no accident. It had been promised by God that such a child would be born, and that promise came to pass. God brought it to pass. It was a miracle birth. It was not a virgin birth like our Lord's, but it was a miracle birth. And so is the birth of everyone who is born again. Not our physical birth, that's natural, but our second birth. That is from God. It's from on high. It, it, is, it is a born again from above. It is, it is God. God is our father spiritually when we're born again. It is a known thing to us. And, and he claims us and speaks to us by name. We, we know when he saves us. And, and we know the feeling of having sins forgiven. And an anticipation of glory in the future. And this world is not our home. And, and we have no affection for it or Whatever we have, we, we try to stifle because it's not our lot anymore to be just as anyone else. Because God has, has blessed us with the blessings and the sure mercies of David, our Lord Jesus Christ. But look that up. It's in Galatians chapter 4. And it speaks about the allegory starting in, let's say, start in Galatians 4 and verse 21. I meant to talk about it, but I, I didn't take very good time, uh, care of my time. God bless you.